so one other very interesting uh, aspect of um, Tibetan Buddhism, which I've also seen that you've written about, um, is just the, the analytical meditations of uh -huh. the Lam Rim. Yeah. And this is something which I, f I find very, very useful. So basically, mm. um, I'd be curious mm -hmm. if maybe you could outline what is analytical meditation and how it can actually serve to uh, support Wow. The, okay. the practice side of samatha and vipassana. You have like certain teachers in, in a quote meditative tradition who will really sort of maybe poo poo analytical meditation is like, you don't need to think if, you know, there's no way of using the thinking process. You're just going to add to more and more proliferation. Yeah. And it seems like analytical meditation is not, is saying the exact opposite. So. Okay. Yeah. Analytical meditation is opposite, but Analytical meditation is done not only with the conceptual mind. When you get to high stages, you know, there's a way of doing analysis while you're in samadhi. Okay. But at the beginning, we're using the conceptual mind. And the reason for this is that, okay, like you look at us, we're, we're Westerners. We didn't grow up Buddhist. There's many uh, things in Buddhism that people take for granted. Yeah, the whole vision of multiple lifetimes, of different realms, of, I mean, so, so many things that are just taken for granted. And there's a whole worldview that accompanies Buddhism. It's not the, the Dharma is not just a meditation technique. It's not just meditation. It's a whole worldview of how you conduct yourself in life and in all the facets of, of what you're doing. And for me, I can say that the analytic meditations, they're helpful in so many of these ways. So, for example, yeah, I, I come in and I hear teachings about the disadvantages of samsara. We've all heard them, right? Okay. And I think, yes, samsara is really, it's, it's just too much. You know, I want to get out. Uh, but first I have to eat some ice cream. Uh, and then I have to uh, watch this movie. And, uh, you know, and then, uh, but I'm really, I really want liberation. I'll, I'll get to it, but then my parents have expectations of me, and I better take care of that too first. Okay, so what you see is you have intellectual knowledge, but it hasn't gone in your heart. It's not here, it's up here. Okay, the analytic meditation, the way it at least functions for me, is it brings it from here into here. Because when you're doing it, you know, there's different points you meditate on and you can make up your own analytical meditation. So there's a, a way, there's a conclusion you want to reach, an understanding that you want to get to. And there's steps to contemplate to get you to that understanding. So you have, you, you know, like I said, you can either have an outline somebody made or you can make up your own depending on what, te you know, what you're studying at the moment. But then what the analytical meditation, what you're doing is you're thinking about those ideas, but not just as, as, as uh, abstract things. It's not just... Oh yeah, there's the there's the three types of dukkha and the six kinds of dukkha and the eight kinds of dukkha, and I can list them all off. Okay, I'm done with that. No, it's not that. It's you apply them to your life, and you think about your own life in terms of those those. You know, this is my life experience. This is not some intellectual thing. Yeah. When we talk about the dukkha of pain, the dukkha of change, the dukkha of pervasive conditioning, this is talking about my life. And then really looking at our lives and seeing how that teaching 
is, is explaining what I'm doing and how I go through so much of my life not aware of that or aware only up in my head. And so when you're able to really get a feeling for it, then your aspiration for, uh, for liberation, your renunciation of, of the dukkha of samsara is much stronger. Yeah. Same thing with generating compassion or, or generating love. It isn't like, oh, metta, I'm in love with metta, you know? And oh, metta is just means wishing others have happiness and its causes. And of course, I wish the whole world have happiness and its causes. It's Christmas time. This is what I write in all my Christmas cards. Of course I want it. I've actualized metta. But this other person down the, the line of, you know, of where I'm sitting, they move their legs too often, and it drives me crazy. And the person up the line, you know, I am jealous of because they, they can sit still longer than I am. And uh, the other person, oh, they brought the nuns in. My God, look at that nun, you know, or they brought the monks in, oh, you know. And, okay, so you know all this stuff, but, but it's not in here. Yeah, so when, if we really want to generate meta, okay, we have to have an equal mind towards all sentient beings first. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, our metta is for the people we like. And that's very worldly, isn't it? I mean, that's exactly what worldly people do. You love your friends and you hate your enemies. You benefit your friends and you harm your enemies. <coughs> and that's what dogs do. Yeah, you know, their friend comes, they wag their tail, they're very happy. You know, a stranger comes, an enemy comes, they bark or maybe they bite, you know. So we've got to make ourselves a little bit different than dogs. Yeah, and so, you know, how are we going to do that? This person that I am jealous of, yeah, how am I going to love that person when I wish that they didn't have the happiness they have. That's the total opposite of metta, isn't it? Metta is wanting somebody to be happy. I don't want them to have happiness because I should have that happiness. They have more recognition than I do. I was ordained first. They were ordained last, but after but people have more respect for them and they not respect for me. Ooh, yeah, I can't stand that. Right? Yeah? So, you know, what am I going to say? Just, oh, I love them. I wish them happiness. <sighs> While underneath, it's like, you know? So... So we've got to deal with this stuff. How, you know, how am I going to overcome my jealousy? And it's not by saying I should love them, I should love them. Yeah. I mean, this is why I became a Buddhist. Because when I grew up in, in a Judaic Christian context, there, you know, it's, you should love your neighbor, but nobody told me how. And these, some of these people are such jerks. How can I love them? The Buddha taught me how. There's a, med, a way to do that. Yeah. So in this case, how do you love somebody? Generate love. Well, you got to start out thinking about their kindness. Okay. And you got to think about their kindness, not in just this lifetime. Because if you're really jealous, you can't even see kindness in this lifetime, okay? Then you have to think, they've been my mother in a previous life. 
Yeah, we've all been each other's mothers and fathers and lovers and enemies and everything. In a previous life, they were my mother. And they cared for me with the tenderness and the protection that even my present mother has. Yeah. So they haven't always been, we haven't always been in the relationship that we're in now. In previous lives, we've been in a different relationship where we've been very close and where my whole life has depended on the kindness of my mother and my father too, who took care of me. And this person did that for me. And not just in one previous life, but you know the sutra that talks when you talk about uh, if you all the Jojo bees in the universe and you know counting all of them and things are countless. Well, that's how many times this person has been my mother and been kind to me. Not just one, like many previous lives. Yeah. And this life, we've just been born in this weird situation where my mind forgets the incredible kindness that they've shown me and just wants to compete with them. Yeah. And what good is competition going to do me? No good. And even though they may be better than me, they're, they have a better reputation, they're more respected. Does that really benefit them? It doesn't take, give them good health and long life. It doesn't advance them on the path. It doesn't get them closer to nirvana. They're still a suffering sentient being. So here's this incredibly kind sentient being who is stuck in samsara just like I am. Yeah, and then you begin to, your whole way, your whole perspective of looking at that person changes. And, and then you're no longer jealous of them. There's nothing to be jealous of. And in fact, your mind wants to repay their kindness. Okay, so this is just a brief outline. But when you do this meditation on the kindness of others, over a long period of time, it really changes your mind, you know? And especially if you have difficult relationships in your life, even if you have difficulties with your present life parents, you know, we've got to overcome that to be able to generate the kind of metta that the Buddha has, yeah, which is for everybody. Okay, so these kind of analytic meditations where you think about this, then you think about this, then you think about this, the, and it leads you to a specific conclusion, they're very beneficial for training the mind. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you, Venerable. Yeah, I, I think the... Um when you're speaking it, it, first of all, you do a good job of describing the drama of monasteries, <laughs> <laughs> everything from greed to aversion. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I'm struck by, I've seen some of what your life has led to in terms of the fruits of Servasti, of a community, of your work in the prisons. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it strikes me that this relationship of expanding, you know, an ego-centered caring and aversion to one individual is, is something you've really endeavored to do towards your relationship to the world, at least it seems that way. And I'm curious, you know, speaking about how these understandings on the surface sink deeper into action and, and the, you know, slow effacement of the ego towards just this path. What has it, what has your path been what's made it sink that deeply for you over the years? Has it been a smooth kind of, was there one moment where you met a certain teacher and it really sunk deeper? Has it been a little like a slow wearing away? Um, how have you, 
you know, what, what's been most meaningful <laughs> and, and how can we cultivate those as monastics? What, what have you seen be the most important aspects in, or trainings for a monastic to remain in robes? Yeah, and, and you want me to answer that in 25 words or less? <laughs> Maybe 30. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for the extra five words. Um, okay, well, you brought up first the teacher. Um, so I think there's two things. There's the inspiration of, of studying under a really, uh, under, under the guidance of a teacher who has practiced and actualized all this. Okay, and then there's just time and repetition. Okay, so, you know, at first, just meeting my teachers and watching how they conduct themselves and act in the world, uh, how they, not just how they, what they say when they're teaching, but how they treat other living beings and the kind of advice they give to others then that uh, expands the mind for me anyway, it really expanded my mind and gave me a lot of faith that this path works and faith in the instructions that I was receiving from this teacher, from my teachers, I have more than one teacher and to know in Tibetan Buddhism, we can have many teachers, but um, knowing watching the example of my teachers and knowing that what they're teaching me is the same thing that the Buddha would teach. Yeah. And so that gives some kind of um, not only inspiration, but some stability in the mind. Yeah. And then you got to go practice. And there's no shortcut around practice. Yeah, they talk about Vajrayana, get enlightened in one lifetime. Good luck. Yeah, his holiness says that's propaganda. You know, if you've done all the work in hundreds of previous lifetimes, then in that last lifetime, boy, you can get enlightened in that lifetime. But, you know, I mean, as Dharma practitioners, we have to look at where our minds are at and be realistic. And if I have friends, enemies, and strangers, uh, you know, Buddhahood is not going to be close for me. <laughs> yeah. If I'm still seeing things as objectively existent out there, and if I'm still clinging to a real me, you know, it's going to take a while for Buddhahood to come. It's not going to be like that. Yeah. And so, you know, I think this is where the inner strength comes from. Not from being macho and boom, I'm going to do it quick and fast. And yeah. But the I think the inner strength comes from being able to practice over time, you know, and you don't give up on yourself and you don't give up on other people and you don't give up on the path because you're convinced the path works. You've had some experience, even if it's this big, something's hit you. That's why you ordained. Um, and it's going to take a while, and that's okay, because if you have that long-term motivation, then you're willing to go through the ups and downs and ups and downs, which we all go through as monastics. It's not smooth sailing. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, you took us out on that boat once, you know. It was chopping, wasn't it? Yeah, so the path is like that. But you try and at least keep your mind in, in as calm as it can be because you're looking far ahead. And if you have a far-term goal 
and you have faith in the path, then the little things don't bother you so much. Yeah. Just, yeah. And you don't go into big crises. But it takes a while to develop that. Yeah. We, we can't, you know, say, I've got to have faith. I've got to have more faith, more faith, more faith. That doesn't work. Yeah. Mm. You have to sit there, contemplate the teachings, apply them to your life. As you do that, then your faith grows. And we're not in competition with anybody else to have more faith. Let me tell you a story regarding this. Um, years ago, you know, when, yeah, when I was younger in my ordination, I compared myself to a lot of different people. And they all had more faith than I did. You know, and they would all go, oh, our teacher, oh, he has so many realizations. And, and the Buddha is so wonderful. And my meditation was great. And, you know, these people are talking like that. And I'm going, I don't have much faith. You know, it's like, yeah, I like my teacher and I believe what he says. And, but I don't have any grandiose uh, things happening in my meditation. You know, the Buddha's not appearing to me and I'm, I'm not, you know, having flashes of, of samadhi or emptiness or what, you know, I'm not having any of that. And these people have so much faith. And then there's just little old me dragging my feet along. Okay. And then after maybe 10, 15 years, then I looked around and many of those people that I thought had more faith than me, they had disrobed. Yeah. Or they had maybe even left the Dharma. And then I realized, oh, first of all, comparing yourself to others is useless. And second, that things just take time to develop in your heart. And, you know, and you've got to have that long-term perspective. But, you know, if you really have, if you've thought about the path and like, why is ignorance the root of samsara? Why? What makes it? And in my mind, you know, can I even see my own ignorance? Can I see how it trips me up? Yeah. Can I see how my afflictions, my klesha, arise from that ignorance. Yeah, because if I can see that, and then if I can see that that ignorance actually misapprehends the way things exist, then even though I am still misapprehending the way things exist, I've had some little glimpse through contemplating this through analytic meditation to know that yeah ignorance is the wrong way to perceive things and it is the root of samsara you know and so okay so i'm confident in that i don't really understand emptiness very well impermanence yeah, I understand, but boy, oh boy, when something unexpected happens to me in my daily life, my understanding of empty, of impermanence is out the window. Yeah, I had, my day was all planned out. And what, what do you mean something new is coming in I have to take care of? Okay, and so, you know, you gain these little bits and then that, renews your confidence in the Buddhist teaching. And then you get to a point where, well, what else am I going to do? If I don't follow this path, what else am I going to do in my life? Okay, well, my parents said, get married, have a career, get the corner office, give me grandchildren, make a lot of money. Do I want to do that? 
No. Yeah, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, forget it, you know. Anyway, you know, and then you begin to look at your own experiences. Oh yeah, I've been in love a lot. And I've always thought, you know, this is fantastic. I'm in love. Have any of them worked out? If they had, I wouldn't be in robes right now. I would be with that person who I thought was so wonderful. None of those things have worked out. Yeah. So what do you do? You go in and you trade in boyfriends. You trade in girlfriends. You go to the used boyfriend store and you pay to get another one. You know, it's going to be the same old thing. What else am I going to do? You know, all this stuff of, you know, they have West Side Story coming out again now. And my generation, oh, we know West Side Story. Maria, Tony, oh, our hearts are together as one. You know, we know the songs. And what happens? Yeah, Tony gets shot. And he dies. And Maria's left there going, hey, this wasn't supposed to work out this way. What happened? And then you realize, you know, this whole thing about romantic relationship is fantasy. It's total 100% fantasy. Yeah. She might have gone into robes, Venerable. You never yes. Know. That would have been good if Maria had gone into <laughs> robes. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Venerable, this is this is very very encouraging. I love hearing you know talk about the long view of path. I also love hearing you know people who've been monastics for decades really extolling the benefits and the beauty of the monastic life. 